The superintendent of schools in Berkeley County, Ron Stevens, making uh, regular appearances on the program, which we uh, greatly appreciate. Ron, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are we doing, gentlemen? We're doing great. Do you have any opinions on how Mike Height should die in John Gilstrap's book? I do not, but I will say that uh, I will not be present if we're going to advertise uh, and put out live everything that happened between <laughs> hands. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 I heard a little bit of that today. And, 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 you, and you walked in a while ago and what was going on? Not be good. It not be good. <laughs> hey, let's uh, let's follow up uh, on truancy with you, if we could, and then yes. I want to get to the situation at Hedgesville's football field, which has caused the disruption of their home football schedule. But mm-hmm. first, uh, staying on the theme of truancy, there seems to be a discrepancy in the number of truant officers that the county has. Right. Well, we have we have four official truancy officers, one for each of the school districts. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean. Sometimes they cross over, but that's uh, basically how those are divided up. We also have a truancy specialist who um, works with our uh, truancy officers once students reach the level of truancy. Because our truancy officers actually are in the schools trying to be proactive to keep students from being truant. Um, so, you know, as they start to pop up on the radar, our, our, uh, our, our people are out there trying to intervene to. Um, make sure that they're in school at every opportunity. And then we have a, our attendance director, Mr. Van Meter, and, um, and one secretary in the office. So we have seven people that actually work in the um, attendance office. Four of those are directly truancy officers to answer your question. The other is a truancy specialist that only works with those students, families, and our truancy officers when once students are truant. I've been told that attendance is an issue in schools post-COVID uh, nationwide, and Berkeley County has its share of issues with it as well. Oh, boy. I, uh, I've attended regional, um, across county lines, across state lines, and statewide meetings, and uh, that that is, it is a dilemma. You know, we spend a couple of years and realize that, you know, we're dealing in a pandemic and we don't want things to spread so you know if you're sick stay home and we send that message and we and we still feel that way if you're too sick to be at school you need you need to take care of yourself but what we're trying to do is make sure that every teachable moment is capitalized on and get us get the students there as as often as possible it uh you know it's a catch-22 when you um um are preaching how important attendance is and you know one of the one of the top predictors of success is attendance um so you know stressing that trying to um, put that out as how important um your future is going to be riding on your attendance um and then at the same time uh understanding when when someone is sick so um you know it's it's just very difficult so during COVID, of course we were able to stream some places better than others classroom activities to the home if a child is sick is there currently an opportunity to join the classroom via a remote location well there are always uh, there are opportunities um, uh, for students to participate in classroom activities Um, but we have to go back to it, it was we were asking our teachers and this it, this is a reflection right now. We were asking our teachers, uh, all of our employees, to basically do two jobs during COVID. Um, you're going to do what you were taught in school and and what your degree has been and and what were what is in your contract. You're going to be teaching students face to face, and then you're also going to be a master of technology. And you're going to be able to do this at home on you know and and have a space that can be dedicated to educating students while i feel like our teachers did an admirable job of trying to do both you know there's no question that they were unable to do both well at the same time um so you know we're back to being able to focus on in-class instruction we believe that the socialization that kids get in in school is extremely important and i think that that's that's what we're striving for and that's that's why we're back to stressing attendance again uh, Ron, the uh, all your all your folks in various ways are put in stressful uh, positions. I would think the truant officer though would be in a world of their own. They're going in an environment that could be very volatile, could be very emotional. Uh, what training do they have? What protection do they have? 
wow, you just go straight to it. Um, well, yeah, you know, you would think that they're, they're actually they're going into a much more difficult situation than most anyone in our community is exposed to, with the exception of the sheriff's department. Well, a majority of the of the meetings of the um, the uh, interventions that they that they are trying to do take place at school. So we want them to be in the safest environment uh, as sure. possible. However, you're correct. They are very vulnerable, um, and we, um, you know, we try to rely on relationships that are built between the um, the uh, truancy officer and the parents. Um, but anytime there's any sense of of a safety issue or things like that, they're they're. Um, hopefully they're working with each other to be in pairs and that's that would be um you know if we got to the safety part that you're referring to there was a uh issue or segment on 60 minutes maybe a year two years ago about a truancy officer in southern florida middle florida and uh and they just hinted at some of the risk that this particular officer took uh she in that this case it was a woman and uh but she would go in situations unescorted do you ever call upon the the sheriff's department to escort you it, it has been done yeah. yes um it, you know i i can think back to 15 20 years ago as a, as a former uh, school administrator and I would accompany our uh, uh, attendance officer to to homes uh, and some of them were scary yeah. and uh, you know I'll, I'll tell you that it was uh, you know you're, you're you're out there and you feel exposed um, you know I give them all the credit in the world for developing the rapport in advance and it really does come down to that that you know you're not cold knocking on a door of people that you've never talked to before sure. um, so you, you are able to in advance majority of the time know know what you're headed to so if we divide the world of truancy into two parts where kids choose to not go to school and parents don't send their kids to school where where's the most prevalent do you find I think at each programmatic level, um, you're talking about differences. You know, you, you've got students who parents don't think can be left by themselves, um, and maybe the parent doesn't value education as much when they're young. Uh, so you, you end up having difficulty getting those younger students to school, and it, it really falls on the parent. Um, We've had some parents who are very thorough about getting their kids to school, and then once they're in the, at the secondary level and they're able to ride a bus home by themselves or come to a come to their house without their parents being there after school, uh, we find then that maybe some students are are choosing to to do that. So um, I'd say it's a it's a blend of what you're talking about, uh, you know, with students. Uh, taking advantage of the system, parents taking advantage of the system, and that is uh, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, trying to impress upon them how important it is, um, you know. And very rarely do you talk to an adult that uh, is, you know, has a successful business or you're working. You talk to them out in the community, um, and they talk about how how much better off they are because they didn't go to school. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The world is so much different now because when we were growing up, we all had days off, right, because we got sick or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, God, it was so boring. You watched the awful. soap operas. You just Because awful. all of your friends were in school. Nowadays, most, so many relationships are virtual, and there's so much to do on computers and such. It, it's Schools have to compete with a lot of distractions. It, you know, I um, the, that last piece that you said, there's a lot of competition mm -hmm. uh, for our students' attention, is right. Um you know, even in the classroom, our teachers in the classroom with students who are in school, we're still having to compete uh, and and be entertainers uh, and educators all at the same time um, because that's what our students are getting used to, and they're bombarded all the time. I can remember sitting at home watching paint dry thinking, yeah, I will not be sick tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> I will sure, not I got 102 be fever, but right. I'm, I'm going to I will to school, not be right? sick tomorrow. Um, but, but there are so many things for students to do now when they're 
when they're uh, not in school. It's, it is competition. But in the in the classroom, the competition. What is your policy with uh, with uh, cell phones? And how do well, you work around that? So. Okay. Well, um, you know, our policy is, you know, off and away it is is what the mantra is. Um, we have steered away from confiscating those devices because the devices now are so expensive. Um, you know, if you drop it, you crack it, you lose it, somebody else takes it. Um, our employees would take a, a large bit of responsibility for that. So, you know, it, it, they are not to interfere with the educational setting. Uh, it can be a disciplinary measure, just like, uh, you know, in the old days, throwing something across the room. If, if you're interrupting the classroom and you're, it's your phone that's doing it, you're interrupting the classroom. But we give these kids iPads, right? So what's, we, what we percentage do. of kids are actually on the iPad not paying attention to what they're supposed to? I'm going to guess it's what, pretty high. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge because they're searching for everything. You know, the, the, what, what everybody out there needs to realize is that when, the, when students are on the iPads at school, they go through the school server. So, the, you know, what they're able to access is limited. It's, it's not, you know, freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're um, sitting on a, on a street corner and you're able to look through every topic that pops up on the iPad. Uh, now, we do have some that, that find creative ways to access things, and those students are disciplined when, when that happens. Um, but by and large, um, they are not able to access. And, you know, but it is still a competitive uh, type of thing where the teacher has got to keep their eyes on the students because they will be opening every app and checking out everything and you know if you're in math class you're looking up science lessons if you're in science class you're looking at math lessons as a student you want to do anything other than what the teacher's telling you <laughs> um and and we realize that so it is a competitive uh it comes down to supervision of them Superintendent of Schools Ron Stevens, our guest here on the program. Let's turn our attention to the football field at Hedgesville High School. Do absolutely. we know exactly what the problem is and how to fix it yet? Absolutely. Um, well, absolutely that we turn our attention there. Um, the, the situation with the, with the football field at, at Hedgesville High School is, is unique. Um, you know, we're, we're, in a, um, we're having a dilemma. The, the sinkhole that appeared, actually, uh, we m may have – dodged a huge bullet we may be very lucky that that it appeared uh, because there are multiple um, uh, spots on the field that are that are suspect um, and because the one spot appeared we were able to bring in um, a, a geotechnical uh, a group to do a geotechnical service uh, review and they deemed that the field was not safe to play on and uh, they did it short term and then they gave us a report and and said that it's not safe to play on in its in its current uh, state. Um, Is there it, an underground water source it, that's draining the soil? Yes, um, y y and as you know, that is one of our facility uh, athletic facility upgrades that we're looking at for next year. Uh, so it it came down to do we do we um, try to rush uh, and and get get something taken care of on this field that. Um, and try to try to get on the field this year. Um, our geotechnical review stated that that would not be not be possible. So we're now at a point where we're uh, we want them to do a more thorough review just to make sure that we don't have issues moving forward with with that site. Um, and the uh, the review has pointed out that there there was a uh, an issue with the water. Uh, to the uh, the uh, sprinkler system on the field, there's a drainage uh, area on the field, um, and somewhere there was a leak, and and it caused a great deal of water to to uh, flood the the areas and um, you know turn the dirt into mud, wash the mud away, and uh, left us with a hole. Um, so you know that that's where we are right now and the uh based on everything that we have uh, gotten back once those things are addressed the field will be would be playable again but uh to be able to do that in the short amount of time remaining in the season this year we just would not be able to do that and then of course planning to uh um redo the site 
next year. Are you, are you turfing it? Yes. Yeah. So this has been driven by what they perceive to be a leak in the irrigation system, which is a little different than most of the sinkholes we find in the county and the region, which do not have anything to do with self-made inducement, such as Blue Ridge. They lost uh, right. a large portion of their parking lot, and they were closed for nearly a year and a half, two years, before they were able to remediate it. You know, you're exactly right. This is, uh, and that's what we wanted the uh, the geotechnical review for to to determine is this something that could happen again that happened in nature, um, and what precautions would we have to take there, or is it something that was that was caused by a leak? Now, we keep saying leak. It was a significant, yeah, sure. It was a significant amount of water. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was. Um, now you get your water from the uh, the county, or do you have a well that you supply? For there the is, um, it's it is county. So you should have been able to recognize beforehand there was a massive leak. Be, well, the it, water bills by the water <laughs> bill, yeah. And the county is very good about that. If they say an unusual amount of water, they notify you. Yes, and that notification came at about the, the, about the uh, same, same time, week. Yeah. The, the that sinkhole. We, <laughs> that we had the sinkhole, yeah. sinkhole period. But. Uh, <laughs> One of the, but we are working with them yeah. to, to uh, establish exactly how much was there and what issues. How happened. big is the hole? Well, um, when we say the hole, as I said before, there are a number of areas on mm-hmm. the uh, on the field that are mushy. Um, you know, it, it hadn't rained in a long period of time, and I walked out onto the field on the crown, and you know, I I sunk in, you know, a couple of inches down in, and water came up over my shoes. Um, in a few places, um, there was actually a um, basketball-sized sink that was filled in. Um, but the hole that we're talking about is the best description I can give you is if you if you took the top eight inches of a five-gallon bucket and you you cut the rim off, you know, made it eight inches, and um, and you put that in the ground and dug all the dirt out of it. That's that's the size of the entrance to the hole. And then underneath of that, it is uh, like a crater. It's, yeah, it's, we, uh, it's the we, darndest thing. We put a lot at the foot of karst topography, the, the area we live in, and some of it's justified. We tend to exaggerate. Uh, sinkholes, I have one on my property that's uh, maybe three times the size of this building. Uh, wow. Huge, but yet it's dwarfed by a sinkhole that's on the adjacent property. Some of the sinkholes were farmers used it as a debris field. You put mm-hmm. it in, two years later, everything would disappear. Right. Most of the sinkholes, though, really do not grow past that small couple of so feet diameter. But yeah. you still have to be aware of them and take care Absolutely. of them. Absolutely. This, this underneath of that entrance to the hole is um, uh, an area that is between two and maybe four feet deep um, and between three and six feet wide. Uh, you know, it's not a perfect circle. It's not a perfect square, but mm-hmm. you know, those are, that's what it looks like. We got a there. picture of the football field. Colin has yeah. put it up on the screen <clears throat> right now as we speak. Yeah. Uh, Ron, they're they're going to Jefferson High School to play some of their home games. Now we have three other Berkeley County high schools. Were none of those available on the dates necessary? You know, not on the uh, on the homecoming date. The first date where they're going to Jefferson High School. Um, it, what Hedgesville was trying to accomplish is very complex. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a, you've got a. Um, we're not just talking about the varsity football team. You got the JV team. You got the freshman team. You got the band. You got cheerleaders. You got a whole variety of activities that are taking place down there, uh, on that field. And when it comes to a halt, you, you know, you've you've got to look at um, concession stand activities and and a whole variety of things. They work their way through. Uh, Hedgesville High School, and this is this is something that, you know, if there was a if there was a weather issue with with a soccer match, uh, you would you would know about it. Um, they would they would reschedule the game. If there was an issue with a baseball game in the spring, you know, they would reschedule the game. With a football game, there's a, a you know it's it's a little bit different. Because you really can't push that off and do double headers and back to back games, and there's windows of time when you can play. So, Hedgesville High School's athletic department and administration was charged with trying to figure out how they can move forward. Um, so, they would, they would make calls, they would check, they, um, 
uh, had to notify the SSAC, um, review sites, see what was available. Uh, Jefferson High School was available for their homecoming game and offer their services. So Hedgesville was able to take advantage of that. They're, they're, they were seeking a field that they could kind of adopt, um, but no field was available for all three dates. Um, and homecoming was coming first, and then there was a – which is this Friday, by the way. And uh, then there's, there was a week off, and then there was two games back-to-back. So they were looking for – a facility that you know where they could get some of their things and get their home crowd you know this is where it's going to be and build a routine as best you can for for two games um so they've they've looked at a few things they've got some ideas uh we're we're waiting for some approval hopefully today we'll we'll be able to receive approval of of a site that could host them for both games uh superintendent shout out time Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to you guys um, for, for having me. And um, I wanted to be able to say we have uh, – I'm excited about a, a bus training opportunity. Uh, so this, this is actually – I want to do this before shout-out time. We have a, a bus training opportunity coming on October the 28th. We're on, uh, on site at our transportation area. Uh, area trying to raise the awareness of of um, the need for for drivers and transportation workers uh, for berkeley county schools you're going to have an opportunity to actually drive a bus so october the 28th at 10 a.m um, be there be square uh, the, and the where's more, the location again the more the merrier at our transportation office uh, i don't have the uh, address for that uh, with me but it is if anyone is interested, they can check us out online and, mm-hmm. or call the office, and we'll let them know. This is Principal Awareness Month. Uh, I'm sorry, Principal Appreciation Month. I wanted to say a shout-out to our principals. Uh, yesterday was Custodian Appreciation uh, – actually, it was Monday, I believe. It was Custodian Appreciation Day. I uh, didn't want to miss out on an opportunity to, uh, to give them appreciation. Uh, we recognize Carrie Law as our ACE Award. Um uh, teacher of the month uh, for uh, Berkeley County Schools, and you know, sub shout out to her husband who stepped in and is the uh, interim head coach at Spring Mills High School. He's doing a very good job. So the Law family is knocking it out of the park. We're really glad to have them around. Um, Parent teacher conferences for our intermediate schools are October the fifth coming up this week, and a couple of important things for students. Um, this Friday is a faculty senate day with an early dismissal, and um, there was a professional learning day on Monday, so there will be no student attendance uh, for that. So, and, John, if you see a bunch of people hanging out at the store, right, don't, call don't, the don't, don't call the police. Don't call Don't call Katie. We don't need to turn them in on Monday, okay? And does 88 Harlan Springs Road in it, Martinsburg sound It is right? 88. Okay. I just got a text. You're exactly right. I, I was drawing a blank. I'm sorry. 88 Harlan Springs Road uh, is the address of our transportation department. Uh, next week, we're going to have the house on wheels at our schools for fire prevention week. And uh, uh, once again, I just want to say thank you to everybody and uh, – uh, Let's keep going. And I got this from Colin. Hedgesville is playing at Shepherd. It was announced for the game October 14 versus Musselman and October 28 against Martinsburg. 11 a.m. kickoffs for both of those. Those are Saturday games. Those are Saturday games. Those those are the um, uh, everything has been taken care of as far as on our end of it. I think we're waiting on a official okay from the SSAC. Maybe they've already received that and, uh, this morning, and I haven't. I wasn't aware of that. Ah, very good. Hey, thanks very much. Appreciate yep. you coming in, Ron. As Absolutely. Always, thank you to Elaine Bobo for setting that up as well.